Well, our article seeks to explain the rise of pro-gender equality norms in foreign policy. Uh, gender equality has become an increasingly salient issue in the contemporary global agenda, as we can see as, the, uh, as part of the SDG agenda and with gender mainstreaming now a very important objective for many international institutions, states and organisations. We have also noticed a growing number of women-friendly states who have taken the lead of promoting gender equality in global affairs. Um, so one of the overarching ambition with this uh, article is really trying to explain the rise of how far pro-gender norms have become embedded in foreign policy domains. So we are very interested to explore how we can trace the con continuity and change in foreign policies with respect to pro-gender norms. At the same time, we also recognize the opposite trend of increasingly antagonistic global politics, notable rise of illiberal democracies, the right-wing populists. Um, so we argue in this article that gender really constitutes one of the major fault lines in contemporary conflicts. At the same time, if we look on scholarship, there's very few studies that cross-nationally analyze and assess the extents to which pro-gender norms uh, are pressed and adopted and practiced in foreign policy. So what we do in this article is to advance an analytical framework on how we can analyze the gendering foreign policy. And by uh, advancing such a theoretical framework, we draw on two strands of research on international feminist theory and on foreign policy analysis. And in the specialist year, we also have five country cases of Australia, Canada, Norway, South Africa, and Sweden. And some of the conclusions that we can draw from these comparative cross-national comparative case studies is that first of all, we are focusing on middle powers in this special issue. And we can see also of these countries, pro-gender norms have been prioritized in foreign policy. And we also here explore the tensions sort of between gender and feminism as well. We also highlight the significance of leadership in advancing pro-gender norms in foreign policy and also how foreign policy practices corresponds with long-held self-images of states seeing themselves as the good states or the women-friendly states. And we also notice uh, the importance of global diffusion of pro-gender norms as perceived as a window of opportunity of advancing uh, foreign policy change in this area. Great question. Well, as, as Karen has already explained, um, our paper is really focused on continuity and change, um, given that gender equality and women's rights norms are among the most contested political phenomenon globally. So we don't expect there to be a linear progressive trajectory where more and more states adopt gender equality and feminist strategies and foreign policy, um, but rather we feel our framework set forth in the paper for comparing uh, across states um, is, uh, enables us to, to sort of look at um, where advances are being made and where setbacks and pushback is occurring. So just to, to give an example, in the last couple of weeks, uh, or, or even in 2019, we've seen really positive leadership shown by South Africa in its foreign policy. Um, during United Nations Security Council negotiations uh, and particularly the two resolutions this year on women, peace and security, which have highlighted the importance of women's participation in peace and security. So that's a really good example of one state really stepping up and using that window of opportunity that Karen talked about uh, um, to, to enhance the, the pro-gender equality focus of its foreign policy. At the same time, we've also seen in 2019 um, in the United States, uh, not a state that's appearing uh, in this uh, special issue on gender and foreign policy, we've seen significant pushback there, where the US has been pushing back on gender equality language, removing gender from many of its uh, foreign policy documents, uh, and pushing back specifically on women's sexual and reproductive freedoms. 
Um, and there, I think, you know, our framework is really attentive to the dynamics that Karen mentioned, the dynamics around power, gender, leadership, norms and diffusion. And in particular, we're able to sort of uh, highlight how the kind of gender games played by hypermasculine leaders like Trump, uh, but also hypermasculine states, which are advancing their own version of geopolitics, are threatening not only the liberal rules-based international order, but also threatening uh, the expansion uh, and uh, protection of uh, women's rights and gender equality internationally. So um, definitely our framework is, is aimed to, to analyze um, both the rise and resistance to pro-gender norms and foreign policy. We can also see um, that some of the, the kinds of uh, arguments that have been used to progress uh, pro-gender norms, um, such as the, the notion that it's smart economics to, uh, to have much more inclusive trade policies, economic development policies, um, aid policies, um, that these are, and, and also the arguments made by states about the importance of inclusive peacemaking, uh, including women in peacemaking processes, um, so that they are, you know, more 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 effective and more likely to 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 uh, to be sustained. Um, that these kinds of arguments, which are kind of rational arguments uh, for pro gender equality norms in foreign policy, these actually face their limitations when they come up against these kind of hyper masculine leaders. And so we're seeing that not only with the United States uh, and the Trump administration, but also with respect to Russia uh, and the efforts of uh, Putin and, and his administration to, uh, to counter pro gender equality norms in, in multilateral institutions uh, as well as through bilateral foreign policy, um, states like Turkey. Uh, as well, we can see very active in this space. Um, and I think that what, what we're really interested here is how advances in, in pro gender equality norms and foreign policy um, are, are pronounced, but so too is backsliding. And we can see that backsliding on women's rights and certainly the United Nations um, in 2020 will be focusing on 25 years since the UN um, Beijing conference, um, which produced the Beijing Platform for Action, which is the most significant international agreement um, setting forced gender equality uh, as, a, um, as a priority for states, that, that, uh, that, 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 that that if that conference were to occur again in 2020, we, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be able to sustain that consensus. So we can see that challenges to democratic institutions, the rise of populism, hypermasculine hyper leaders are presenting significant challenges um, for pro-gender uh, equality foreign policies. But what's really interesting here is that that doesn't make our argument any less salient, um, but rather what we can see here is this much more visible contestation of, of gender norms in foreign policy than ever before. So we can see both the implementation of these norms and the non-implementation and resistance to them. Um, so we propose a framework uh, for comparative analysis um, that identifies and explains, um, you know, whether we're going to see the rise or resistance to the norms. And what we think here is um, that th this framework we offer has the potential to transform the way that we study foreign policy making and foreign policy leadership, um, which has to date, as Valerie Hudson has argued, um, been a largely gender blind field.